Thank you for joining us today. If this is your first time, welcome. Click the link below to connect with us. If you are a seasoned Southern Hills Sermon Watcher, welcome back. If you need anything from prayer to counseling, click the link below to connect with a pastor. Now, let's get into God's Word. One of the things that children's ministry is to do is teach children how to memorize the Bible. And I thought to myself as I was preparing this sermon, maybe this would be a good opportunity for me to teach you how to memorize the Bible. How many of you today are ready to memorize a Bible verse? If you're ready, say amen. amen. You say, no, teach us the story because that's why we're here. I know why you're here, but I promise you it'll help you understand this story. The Bible verse I want you to memorize is from the book of Proverbs. Uh, go ahead and put it on the screen. Proverbs chapter number 15 and verse 3. Now as you can see, part of the verse has been blocked out because that's the way I want to teach you. If you're an educator or a teacher in the room, you know this method. I'm going to teach the audience this particular Bible verse as we memorize portions of it. It begins, the eyes of the Lord. Yeah, some of you are a little slow today. Say it with me. The eyes of the Lord. Say it again. The eyes of the Lord. You know what always helps me is, is some motions, right? Some, some I, I like to gesture, right? I'm sure I have Italian in me somewhere, right? I, I'm an American. We all have some Italian, I guess, right? And the, eyes, uh, the eyes of the Lord. Let's do it this way. The eyes of the Lord. No, you got to do it. Put your stuff down. There you go. Okay. You're part of the church now, so let's go, all right? Let's do it together. The eyes of the Lord. I will point you out. <laughs> the eyes of the Lord, go to the next part of the verse. This will be another part that we memorize. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Ah, yeah. Leon. I better, I better see some activity here. Let's try it again. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Very good, very good. Let's do it again. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Last part of the verse, you've almost got it memorized. You're doing very well. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Can we do it together? Let's do it together. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Keeping watch on the evil and the good. Let's do it one more time. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Keeping watch on the evil and the good. All right, now it's in your mind. You'll never forget it. Okay. Yeah, really? I do all these sermons and that's what we get applause for? Okay. All right, fine. All right, we'll do it every week. All right. The story are about the eyes of God. That's what chapters 5 and 6 of the book of Esther are all about. So I want that to be in your mind. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Keeping watch on the evil and the good. Because Esther chapter 5 teaches us this particular story. Now, for those who are new um, and for those who have been, let's do a little review uh, of the main characters of the story. First of all, there's a guy named Xerxes. He's the king, and if there's one word to describe Xerxes, it's powerful. He is powerful. I'll say Xerxes, you say powerful. Xerxes, powerful. He's the most powerful man of the world at this time. He's the emperor of a land called Persia. Persia, in, in the United States, we have 50 states. In Persia, they had 127 provinces. This is a massive empire, and he's the most powerful man, the big top dog, the king of kings. But it's not only Xerxes. If there's one word to describe him, it's powerful. If there's another person in the story, that's Queen Esther. Say, yay! We love Queen Esther. If there's one word to describe Queen Esther, I would use the word plucked. Plucked. Why? Because she was plucked from obscurity, and she was made queen of the entire empire. So Xerxes is powerful. Esther is plucked from obscurity. She's a Jewish descended individual, which is very important to our story. She is a Jew who has become the most powerful woman in all of Persia. There's another character. His name is Haman. Haman, if there's one word to describe Haman, he's the villain of the story. Go ahead and go, boo, yeah, yeah, he's a bad guy. If there's one person, word to describe Haman, it would not be plucked. It would not be powerful. I guess I would describe him as prideful and prejudiced. He really loved himself, and he really hated the Jews, hated the Jews. He was 
anti-Semitic. Say it with me, anti-Semitic. That means he hated Jewish people for some reason. People are prejudiced. And so was Haman, very bad guy. Uh, and then there's a hero of the story, another hero. We call him Mordecai. Mordecai is the Jewish leader who works in government. He happens to be related to Esther. And when I think of the word Mordecai, I think of the word, the name Mordecai, I think of the word principled. He, was, he did what was right no matter what it would cost him. And the last thing we saw from Mordecai, who said to his adopted daughter, Esther, there was this massive law that had just been written. On a certain day, there would be a purge in all of Persia to kill all of the Jews. And nobody knew that Esther was a queen, was also a Jew. And so Mordecai says to Esther, perhaps God has perfectly positioned you and placed you in the position of power for such a time as this. You've got to do something about this. And so she does. She goes before the king and she says, I have a request. And he said, whatever you want. And he, she said, I want you to come to a banquet with me. And she makes a banquet and she only invites the bad guy, Haman, and the king, Xerxes. And after the banquet is where we pick up the story in part five of the sermon series, The Hidden hand of God. Let's say that verse together. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. And I know you know that, but some of you have been Christians for so long you've forgotten. That God is watching and He knows. He's not only watching evil, he's watching good. What does God see? That's the question. In this story, there are three words that I want to point out that God sees in this story and God sees in your story. The three words are vengeance, heroism, narcissism. Can you say it with me? Vengeance, heroism, Narcissism. Here's what God sees in the story, and you're about to see as well. He sees vengeance. He sees heroism. He sees narcissism. He sees it in this story. He sees it in yours. Let's go ahead and talk about that first one. First in the story, we see that God sees vengeance in this story, and he has to deal with it. Look at what it says in verses 9 through 14. So Haman went out that day joyful and with a glad heart. Now, where is he going out from? We're picking up right in the middle of the story. Haman has just left that banquet, that feast of wine that Esther had put on for the king and for Haman. And now he's leaving the party. He's a little tipsy, and he's very happy and proud of himself. And he's going to go home to his wife and tell his wife how great of a man he is. Because Haman's favorite subject to talk about is Haman. And as he leaves, the Bible says something trips him up. Something makes him upset. What is it that makes Haman upset? But when Haman saw Mordecai. When Haman saw Mordecai the Jew in the king's gate, and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. You see, everybody else bowed before Haman. When Haman walked by Mordecai, Mordecai stood and stared him in the eye and said, I don't bow before anybody but God. And this drove Haman crazy. Why? Because Haman is a narcissist. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself. He didn't kill him right there. And went home and he sent and called for his friends and for his wife Zeresh. So he goes home to his own little mansion, his palace. We know he's a very wealthy and powerful man. We know this because of the stories we've already heard and the stories we're about to see. He goes home to his wife and his friends and he calls them together to complain. And Haman told them, what do you think Haman's going to tell his friends and his wife? Haman told them of his great riches and the multitude of his children and everything in which the king had promoted him and how he had advanced above the officials and the servants of every other king. As was stated before, every narcissist has one favorite subject, and that is himself. 
And whenever he feels bad about how life is going, the only way to make him feel better is to either pull somebody down or brag about how awesome he is. And so he brings his family and his friends around and he says, I want you to know what's going on in my life. First of all, you know how wealthy I am. Yeah, buddy, you're super wealthy. And you know how important I am. You know how many children I have. You, that might be a weird flex for some of you, but back in the ancient world, you know, this was a big deal, right? Like today, if you meet somebody and they're like, we have 12 kids, you're like, are you okay? <laughs> right? But back in the ancient world, like this was a massive thing. You say, how many sons did he have? History tells us he had 208 sons. He got busy. Like he was a very busy man. 208 sons. You say, how is that possible? Don't you remember what we studied about this man even two weeks ago? He was so wealthy that he put a, um, he, he put a number and paid the empire a quarter of a billion dollars, 325 tons of silver, just to have all the Jews eliminated, right? That was his, that's the thing. He actually was able to come up with a quarter of a billion dollars as a price to get people killed. This is how powerful and how wealthy he was. And so he had as many women as he wanted, and he had as many children as he wanted. He had 208 sons. That doesn't even include the 10 legitimate sons he had with his wife. That's a lot. And he's trying to demonstrate how important he is. Isn't it kind of pathetic whenever you come across somebody who has to constantly remind you how important they are? It's never admirable to come against arrogance. It's never attractive when you come against pride. Moreover, Haman said, besides, besides all this, Queen Esther, did you know? Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king into a banquet that she had prepared. And tomorrow, I am again invited by her along with the king. He said, I, I just had dinner with them, and tomorrow they made another banquet, and I'm going to go to dinner again tomorrow. And then he says, yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. He had everything he could possibly want, but he could not be happy until his enemy was not happy. Let me just stop and say, hey, careful now, look, at, look up here. We all have a little bit of this kind of a bad attitude in our own hearts, don't we? Like you're doing fine until you find out that somebody you don't like is also kind of doing fine. And this comes up inside of you. What is this? It's the spirit of Haman. It is satanic, it is demonic, and it must be crushed in our souls. Amen. We must not look out there and say, that's the way they are. We as Christians must look in here and say, have we ever been guilty of this? Amen. Verse 14, then his wife Zeresh has an idea. Zeresh is not a good person. His wife Zeresh has an idea, and all of his friends said to him, hey, Haman, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high, and in the morning, go to the king and suggest that Mordecai be hanged on the gallows. Then merrily go to the king's banquet. This is her suggestion. I know what you could do. You could have him killed, and then you can enjoy your evening. Wow. Now, let's talk about gallows. When I say the word gallows, your mind thinks of these. This is not the type of gallows they would have had during this time. Understand, the type of hanging would have been around during this time, but what was, what was appropriate or what was known during the Assyrian Empire as well as the um, Persian Empire was gallows was also a wooden structure that would have been built, but they would not have built a rope to put around somebody's neck and <coughs> strangle them. They would have built a giant pike that was normally about 12 to 15, 18 feet tall. And they would build it on a hillside. And by the way, the pike, historically, eventually, is taken by the Greeks and the Romans and turned into a cross to be hanged on. So before the cross, there was the pike. And the Assyrians, then followed by the Persians, the Babylonians used it as well, would take the offending parties and they would build a scaffolding around up to the 18 feet. And they would take the individual that they wanted to die and they would hang them 
Understand? They're children in the room. They would hang them, and there they would die. Now, the Bible says this was a 50 cubits high. You say, well, cubits. I mean, how big is a cubit? 75 feet. So here's what her suggestion was. Go to the middle of the city, and instead of building an 18-foot high pike, build one that is seven stories tall. Build scaffolding around it so that you can take your enemy, place him on top of the pike, and kill him. Why so tall? So that, so that he can be an example. When you stand against Haman, this is what happens to you. Wow. Vengeance. I like it. Love the idea. If somebody comes after me, I go back after them twice as hard. Somebody hits me on this cheek, I will smash them into the ground. Vengeance is the desire of men like Haman. And this thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. You say, wait a second. Is God watching Haman plot against Mordecai? Yes, yeah. Do you remember our Bible verse? How, well, you know, how, the eyes. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Why does the Bible tell us that God is watching all the evil? Why does God want us to know this? Could it be possible God wants you to know that he's keeping track of the evil because he's going to take care of the evil? Vengeance. Is there anybody in the room, don't raise your hand, who's thinking to themselves, I cannot believe they did this to me. This is how I'm going to get them back. Careful. Vengeance. You see, the problem with vengeance is that it's a boomerang. You, you, you've seen a boomerang before. You throw the boomerang correctly, it's supposed to come right back to you. Do you know what happens with people who try to seek out vengeance? Here's what happens. Every time you try to go after them for what they did to you, you end up being the person who gets hurt. Vengeance is thievery. God said to the church in the book of Romans, vengeance is mine, I will repay. It's not that God is not watching, and it's not that God doesn't have a plan to get back at them. Of course God does, but he says it's my job to get back at them, not your job. Because if you try to do it, it's only going to hurt you. Isn't that what the book of Proverbs says? Look at this next verse. The book of Proverbs, chapter number 26 says, whoever digs a pit will fall into it. Whoever rolls a stone will have it roll back on him. See, some of us have devised all of these incredible plans to get back at the enemies for what they've done to us. And what you don't realize is that, number one, God has watched the evil they did to you. He'll take care of it. But number two, if you try to take care of it yourself, your trap will only trap you. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Because oh, if you don't, you're the one that's going to fall in the pit. You're the one that the stone will roll on. God is watching, number one, vengeance. Number two. Does anybody remember the second word that I told you God was watching in this story? Number two? Heroism. Say it with me. Heroism. God is watching heroism in this story. That's true. Look at verses one through three. Look at what it says. That night the king could not sleep. What night? Well, the night they had the banquet, remember? They had this big banquet. Esther goes off and goes to sleep. Mordecai, uh, 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 the king goes off and goes to, tries to go to sleep. Uh, and, and Haman goes back to his family and talks into the late into the evening, right? The king goes down to lay down in his royal palace, and he looks up into the ceiling, and he can't go to sleep. Has this ever happened to you? How many of you just lay down, and you're like, I, my mind won't stop. I can't sleep. Now it's midnight. Now it's 1 a.m. Now it's 2 a.m., it's three. How many of you have ever been there? How many of you, um, what, what do you do when you can't sleep? I'm interested. What do you do? Somebody tell, what do you do when you can't sleep? You go on your phone, right? You go on your phone, and you're like, ha, 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 dopamine, ha, 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 right? 
Somebody else, what else do you do when you, go to sleep, when you can't go to sleep? What do you do? Yeah, what do you do? You watch TV, put on a little Netflix, right? Watch Seinfeld season 12 for the 40th time, right? <laughs> Somebody else? What else? What else do you, what do, you do when you go, can't go to sleep? You take a pill, all right? We have drug addicts here as well, which is good. That's good. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. My wife is the biggest drug person. She's like, you want some melatonin? You want some melatonin? Take a melatonin. Just take it. Take another melatonin. I'm like, my parents told me to avoid people like you. It's like, take a melatonin. All right. What did the king do when the king couldn't sleep? Well, what the king would do is he would have his royal chroniclers, that means the people who actually kept the history of the kingdom, come and read the royal history. Um, they were called the chronicles of the king for a reason. Uh, when you're that important of a person, somebody follows you around for your entire life like a court stenographer keeping track of everything you say and everything you do. And we, we learned about this way back in episode one and episode two, that there's somebody following the king around, writing everything down that the king goes through. So the king is there, he can't sleep, and he says, hey, hey, hey. Somebody bring me the chronicles of the king and read them to me, because those will help me sleep. Which ones, king, do you want brought? And in his mind, deep down in his heart, something made him think. Bring me the chronicles from seven years ago. King Xerxes had a moment seven years before when there was a beauty pageant, and he met a woman for the very first time. Their relationship was not good, but he looks back on those moments with fond memories. Br bring seven years ago. And so it just so happened that he could not sleep, and it just so happened they read seven years ago Chronicles. And now, three, four o'clock in the morning, the king is trying to sleep, and, and we pick up in the story. And it was found written that Mordecai had told Bigthna and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers, who were sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. See, years before, there had been an episode where Mordecai, the Jew who worked in the government, overheard an assassination plot against the king. And as soon as he heard it, he went and he told who just his daughter, who just so happened to be the new queen, hey, you need to tell the king there's an assassination plot against him. And they went and did an investigation. Sure enough, they were planning an assassination. And both of those men were taken and they were hanged on a pike. And everybody was safe. And the king's life was saved against the assassination plot. But the very next verses in chapter 3 say, but Haman got a promotion in the kingdom. But Mordecai got no promotion. Almost as if God never saw the heroism of Mordecai. And now, seven years later, a guy can't sleep. All of a sudden, he hears about this plot to assassinate the king. And the king wakes up and thinks, wait a second, wait a second. I think I remember that. What does it say we did for the guy who saved my life? W what's written about what we did for him? Chronicler looks. Uh, yeah, king, it says nothing. It, apparently, we didn't do anything for him. And the very moment the king finally realizes we did nothing for Mordecai is the same moment that the sun is about to rise over the eastern horizon in the Persian Empire. I don't know if you are like me, but sometimes, truly, I want to be real with you, Sometimes I, 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 um, I wonder if anybody notices. Do you, do you ever sit back and wonder if anybody notices what you're doing? Like the good stuff, not the bad stuff. I don't know why it is. It seems like people are always really good at finding the bad stuff. Is that true for you as it is for me? Maybe at work, I mean, you're killing it. Like, you're trying your best. You work with integrity. You work with hard work. You look around. You're not trying to be judgmental, but you're like, honestly, I'm doing great here. And it's like nobody cares. It's like nobody sees it. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Keeping watch on the evil 
but also the good. You're waking up every single morning at 2 o'clock to feed the child who doesn't even know how to call you mama yet. And you love the moment. At least you know you're supposed to love the moment. <laughs> and you're like, this is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and it'd be amazing if it happened like twice a year, but it's every night. <laughs> and somewhere inside of us, we wonder, like, does anybody notice? Does anybody care? Does anybody see? And God, over and over in the Bible, says the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Keeping watch on the evil and the good. Friend, I don't know what heroic act you've done this week or done five years ago. If you're wondering if God ever took notice or if you'll ever be rewarded, God's clear answer to you is yes. I saw it and I will give you back. I will. What does God see in this story? The eyes of God. We see that God sees vengeance. He sees heroism. Does anybody remember the third word that we we're going to study? He sees narcissism. I got to tell you, man, God hates narcissism. I know what some of you are thinking. As soon as you heard the word narcissism, you're like, oh, good. I know a narcissist. <laughs> I got some bad, bad news for you. If your very first thought is good, I know a narcissist, it's probably you. <laughs> right? It's probably you that's struggling with the fact that everything is about you. And here's the thing that God says over and over. He hates a prideful look. I didn't say he hates you. He loves you. But when he sees someone he loves strut around as if they're better than everybody else, demanding their way, he hates that for you because it's destroying you and it's hurting others. God sees narcissism. L look what happens with Haman, the narcissist in our story. It says in verse 4, so the king said, who is in the court? Remember, the sun is just coming up over the eastern horizon in the Persian Empire. And, and the king's been up all night, and now he's got this idea. He's like, Mordecai, save my life. We got to help Mordecai. Let's do something good for Mordecai. Now, who's in the king's court? I heard somebody show up, uh, and they said, now Haman had just entered the outer court. Haman, Haman who? Haman, the bad guy who had just come to the court early in the morning to do what? To ask the king if he could put somebody on a pike. Who does Haman want to put on a pike? Mordecai. Correct. Who does the king now want to honor? This is going to get weird. <laughs> this, is, this is really, the tension's kind of mounting here. So the king says, this is really funny, this is really funny. Now the king says, <laughs> now Haman had just entered the king's court and the king's palace to suggest to the king that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Wait, what? Hold on, stop. Timeline. How many of you watch a movie and you're like, plot hole, plot hole, plot hole? How many of you do this? In the story, you're like, wait a second. Didn't he just come up with the idea of building the 75-foot pike like, I don't know, like, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. last night, and now it's like 6 a.m., so he has the pike already built? Come on. In six to eight hours, this man is so powerful and so wealthy, he could say, go get it done, and by the time he stands before the king, it's done. This man knows how to get things done. I think we should hire Haman for our building project. Can I get an amen? Like, let's get the, I'm kidding. It's a joke. Heather said, don't use that joke. It's a bad joke. But I did anyway, so I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. It's a joke. Verse 5. The king's servant said to him, Haman is there standing in the king's court. Now, the king's thinking to himself, fantastic. This is my number one advisor. He can help me figure out how to honor Mordecai. So the king says, let him come in. So Haman came in to the king, and the king says to him, I've got a question for you, Haman. I'm really glad you came. I've been up all night thinking about this. What can I do to honor the man whom the king wants to honor? He says, I've got a big problem. I've been thinking about it all night. There's somebody in the kingdom that is really amazing. Somebody that I really want to show honor to. I mean, he's the top of the tops, the best of the best, the cream of the crop. Haman, what would you do to honor this kind of a man? Now, what is a narcissist naturally going to be thinking? 
Well, King, I'm, I'm so glad you brought this up. I was thinking the same thing, quite frankly. But, you know, I, I wanted you to come up with the idea. It's literally what it says. Look what it says. Now, Haman thought in his heart, who would the king delight to honor more than me? Narcissism is either hilarious or disgusting. And you don't want to be either, friend. Three traits of a narcissist. Here they are. Self-important. The narcissist won't say if they do believe they are the most important person in the room. Number two. A narcissist is needy of praise. Constant validation needs to be flowing in and remind me how great I am. Because if I don't feel great, then there's something wrong with me. Number three, entitlement. I deserve. Here's what I deserve. This is what I deserve. This is what I deserve. So what does Haman do? Haman says... Well, king, if you really want to honor somebody, this is what you do. Take a royal horse with the royal signet, place it upon the royal horse's head, a horse that you've ridden, and take your royal robes, royal robes that only the emperor would wear, and put them over his shoulders, and place this man on your horse. Now, doing so in the ancient world was making yourself equivalent to the king. So Haman's like, I'll tell you what you do. Here's what you do. Let this man ride on your royal horse. Let this man wear your royal garments and put the royal seal upon the horse's head and then take the most important, impressive prince in the entire kingdom and lead him around through the entire city on the horse and say, this is the man whom the king desires to honor. And Haman's like, this is going to be so much fun. A parade for Haman? And so the king says, I love this idea. Fantastic. Now look exactly at the text because it blows me away each time. The king said to Haman, yes, hurry, take the robe and the horse that you have suggested and do so for dun, 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 <laughs> Mordecai the Jew who sits within the king's gate, leave nothing undone that you have spoken. And could you see Haman's face? <laughs> Mordecai the Jew. Man, I got to tell you, I will never stand and become an enemy of the Jewish people. You're a fool to do so. Whew. What a fool. What a fool. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch over the evil and the good. And if I become an enemy of God, I think he sees that. If I become an enemy of his people, I think he sees that too. Anybody garden? Anybody here garden? Anybody like to garden? Any gardeners here? You put stuff in the ground and stuff comes up. Anybody do, does this? Raise your hand if anybody got, you're like, no, we live in a desert. Like, what? <laughs> Who gardens? You garden? Lexi? Yeah. Lexi, what do, you, what do you garden? What do you put in the ground that comes up? Uh, Lots of things. Pick one. Uh, herbs. What, what, what herb do you put in the ground? Uh, Rose. Ooh, rosemary. How many of you like some rosemary chicken? <laughs> How many of you are like, Pastor, don't talk about rosemary chicken. It's still an hour before lunch. And so to get rosemary to come out of the ground, Lexi, where'd you go? There you are. Lexi, to get rosemary out of the ground, you have to plant apple seeds. No? What do you have to plant? Rosemary seeds. Oh, that makes sense. And I'm not even a farmer. You say, well, of course. I know some of you are new to the church. You're like, what are you talking about? Okay. If you want to get rosemary out of the ground, you have to plant rosemary seeds. It's going to be shocking if you plant rosemary seeds and get oranges. You'd be like, something went wrong. 
You say, you'd be fooled to think that. Yet so many of us are living incredibly foolish because we have been planting narcissism. We've been planting vengeance. We've been planting greed. We've been planting lust. We've been planting anger. We've been planting hatred. We've been planting bigotry. And we look at our lives and we wonder why all of these crops are coming up around us. They're terrible. This is why the New Testament says, God is not mocked. Don't be deceived. Whatever a man puts into the ground, that's what's going to come forth. If you put evil into the ground, evil's going to come up. If you put good into the ground, good will come up. Why? Because the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. And the good. See? So this man, this narcissist, he goes back to his family. And by the way, it's fascinating because in verse 12, after Mordecai is led on the horse and Haman is shouting out, this is the man whom the king wants to honor. <laughs> the Bible says Mordecai goes to his house and Haman goes to his house. Now Mordecai doesn't go directly home. He just goes back to his job. Look at verse 12. I love this. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. Do you see the comparison contrast between humility and pride? Mordecai, after they gave him a parade, was like, well, time to go back and do what I'm supposed to do. Just continue to do what God wants you to do. And what does Haman do? <laughs> this guy. Haman goes back to receive comfort from his family and friends. You know, the people he pays to like him. <laughs> and he goes back to them, and this is what he says to them. Look at what it says in the next passage. So when Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, now you would think they would say, everything's going to be okay. You'll kill Mordecai. It's going to be fine. But he went to receive comfort, but instead he got a prophecy from God. Notice what his wife says. If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Whoa. Oh, wow. I mean, it's kind of what God always said. They are my people, those who are for you, are for me. Those who are against them are against me. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. That's why even like, like 2,500 years after this story, I'm like a modern day American. I'm like, yeah, I'm good with the Jews. Whatever the Jews want, that's what I'm good with. You say, why? Because I believe the Bible. The enemies of the Jew are my enemies because they're the enemies of God and God's people. pretty simple and while <laughs> this, is, this is wild while they say this to Haman Haman's like what you're saying that he's gonna overcome me while these words were still talking to him the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared so now there's a knock at the door and they go and they enter it and there's the two immortals from the king and they're like dinner's ready And now you see Haman grabbed by two guards and he's walking toward the banquet. The last banquet he'll ever have because as he sits there at the banquet with Queen Esther and King Xerxes, like Chekhov's gun looming in the back is a 75 foot pike that is thirsty to be used. That's where we'll pick up the story next week. I hope you enjoyed that sermon. Make sure to subscribe to never miss a sermon video. If you would like to partner with us financially, click the link below. And if you would like to connect further, reach out to us on the connect link. May God bless you abundantly as you continue your journey of faith. Until next time, take care and see you soon.